Hello everyone, this is Pulkit from The Spiritual Bee and in this video presentation we are going to see how the current scientific picture of God and the universe compares with the Vedantic view. Now before I begin I would just like to point out for those viewers who have chanced upon this video directly from YouTube that this video is actually part 3 of a 4 part series titled The Consciousness Conundrum Facing Science. Now parts 1, 2 and 4 are not videos but blog posts and if you wish to read them then you can access them by clicking on the links posted in the description box below. So having said that let us begin this very interesting and I hope informative presentation. Now in part 2 of our Consciousness Conundrum Facing Science series, we have seen that many leading scientists such as Stephen Hawking have rejected the biblical story of creation. According to this story, God, a supernatural person who resides in heaven, created the universe and everything in it from plants, animals to humans in six successive days. Now science has shown that this story cannot possibly be true because the universe was not born in six days, rather it took billions of years to evolve into its present condition. And therefore, if the story of creation is false then the creator God also cannot exist. So science has dismissed the creator God completely and in this decision they are supported even by India's Vedanta philosophy which itself rejected the existence of such a God many thousands of years before the Bible was even written deeming the idea as too simplistic. Next, and here comes the most important part, after rejecting the simplistic idea of the creator God, many western scientists such as Stephen Hawking have taken a giant leap and dismissed God entirely from the cosmos. In doing so, these scientists have actually glossed over some of the deeper and profounder descriptions of God, particularly those that describe God to be a conscious spiritual reality that is non-material in nature by which is meant that God is not made of matter and therefore does not obey its laws, eternal meaning that he is not bound by time and omnipresent implying God is present everywhere simultaneously. Now these deeper descriptions of God which go beyond the ideology of personhood meaning God is a person like us are present not only in the Bible but in most major religions of the world and these deeper ideas are actually not so easy to dismiss because there could very well be such a background reality to the cosmos and there is no method in science currently to either prove or disprove it. Now one reason why not too many western scientists have explored these deeper descriptions of God is because even though these ideas are present in seed form in all major religions of the world, the fully developed tree of thought is found only in India's Vedanta philosophy with which most people in both the west and the east are largely unfamiliar. Now we shall return to the Vedantic view of God and the universe in just a few moments but for now let us revert back to the prevailing scientific picture and examine it in a little further detail. Okay, so we have seen that many western scientists have reached the conclusion that God simply does not exist. And if you read the books written by Stephen Hawking or by Richard Dawkins, a British biologist, then you will immediately see that these eminent scientists have arrived at their erroneous conclusion mainly by focusing their attention on the incorrect and simplistic description of God as an outside supernatural person, all the while ignoring the deeper explanations which cast God as not a person but a background spiritual reality to the cosmos. Now if God does not exist then the soul also cannot exist and so many scientists have discarded the soul as being the source of consciousness and instead hypothesized that matter must be the absolute rock bottom ground reality of the universe and therefore consciousness too must somehow arise out of the activity of atoms and molecules of matter. This idea that any complex phenomena in the universe, even consciousness, can ultimately be reduced to or explained in terms of interactions between atoms and molecules of matter is known as reductionism. Take for example water. I can explain the phenomena water as two atoms of hydrogen combining with one atom of oxygen to produce water. So many scientists think that consciousness too must be something like that. When atoms and molecules combine in the brain during electrochemical interactions, consciousness must somehow be produced. This is called reductionism and what scientists are basically saying is that matter is the primary substance of the universe, it came first before everything else and all life and all consciousness are secondary phenomena. They came second because they arise from matter. Now the question here becomes, can consciousness really arise from matter? There is no actual proof that it does and what the scientists have been proposing is just a theory as of now. However, even for a theory, this idea of matter as the originator of consciousness has far-reaching consequences because it immediately reduces all life including human beings to mere biological machines with no specific aim or purpose. 
In other words, we are no different from stones. Just like stones, we too come under the strict control of matter and its laws. For example, if I throw a stone up, it has to obey the law of gravity and come down. It has no free will of its own to stay up if it pleases. Similarly, human beings are also bound by the laws of matter and as Stephen Hawking writes in his book The Grand Design, to think that we have free will to choose whether we want to eat popcorn or watch a movie is simply a grand illusion. Now this denial of free will to human beings even intuitively does not sound right. And for more on this, be sure to read part 4 of our Consciousness Conundrum series, a link to which is provided in the YouTube description box below. Ok, so now that we have an idea how many western scientists, though not all, view God and the universe, let us turn to India's Vedanta philosophy and see what it has to say on this topic. Now for those who are not familiar, Vedanta is a collection of truths concerning the nature of reality that have been observed by the ancient sages of India in the advanced states of meditative superconsciousness. And as we move through this discussion, you will notice some interesting parallels with the scientific perspective and also some key differences. The first parallel to note is that just like science, Vedanta too has rejected the simplistic idea of the creator god. The reason for this is as follows. Consider this picture of a potter creating pots. Vedanta says that we cannot envision God to be like this potter. In other words, we cannot think of God as being an outside supernatural person who created the universe just as a potter creates his pots. Because if God was like this, then two things need to exist separately. The first is God the potter and the second is the clay or the material out of which he fashioned the universe. So we have God on one side and matter on the other. Now at this point a question arises. How did this matter or clay that God used to make the universe come into existence? If we say that God must have created it, then a counter question immediately arises. Out of what? Since something cannot come from nothing, there must have been some prior substance out of which God created matter. And if this prior substance exists, then a new question immediately arises. How did this prior substance come into being? This line of reasoning continues till infinity and we see that the two separate existences of God and matter can actually never be reconciled. So the correct view according to Vedanta philosophy is that God has not created the universe out of some external substance, but he himself has become the universe and everything in it. The entire universe is not a creation but a manifestation of the Lord. So God is not the creator but the manifester. It is God himself who has become the earth, sun and moon. He alone has become the sky, air and water. And it is God himself who appears as plants, animals and humans. But how is this possible? Let us see that next. According to Vedanta philosophy, the entire universe can be understood to be a manifestation of God when we realize that God is not a person but a vast and infinite ocean of consciousness that forms an invisible backdrop to the visible cosmos. In fact, our universe of matter, space and time can be thought of as floating in this ocean of consciousness just as a bubble floats in water. Now in our day-to-day -day existence, when we think of the word consciousness, which is called Chit in Sanskrit, we immediately associate it with awareness. So when we say that God is the ocean of consciousness, it means that God himself is conscious or aware of everything. In other words, all knowledge is contained in God. But is being aware or having knowledge alone sufficient to create anything? It is not, because in order to create something, we need a force, a power or shakti as it is called in Sanskrit. So Vedanta tells us that this infinite ocean of consciousness called God is not just a mass of awareness, but it contains within it an accompanying power known as Chit Shakti or the creative force of consciousness. It is this creative force that introduces various kinds of motions or vibrations in the infinite ocean of consciousness. And it is from these varying modes of vibration of the one eternal and underlying ocean of consciousness that the entire universe ranging from inanimate matter to living beings emerges. It is for this reason that Vedanta says that God is present in all forms of creation. From the rivers to the mountains to plants, animals and humans, God alone is present everywhere and in all things. There is no place in the universe where God is not because the whole world arises from vibrations of one consciousness. In fact, even matter arises from consciousness. The only difference being that in matter the awareness element of the underlying consciousness is veiled or dormant and so matter appears lifeless. Whereas as we move up the evolutionary chain from plants, animals to humans, more and more of the underlying consciousness is revealed, reaching its current highest manifestation in human beings. Ok, so now that we have gone through both the scientific and the Vedantic perspective on God and the universe, we are in a position to summarize and draw some interesting conclusions. 
The first point to note is that both science and Vedanta have dismissed the existence of the creator God, by which is meant the idea of God as an outside supernatural person who created the universe just as a potter creates his pots. However, unlike Vedanta, after rejecting the simplistic idea of the creator God, many western scientists have taken a giant leap and arrived at the atheist position by dismissing God and soul entirely from the cosmos. In its place, these scientists have proposed that matter is the ultimate reality and consciousness too must somehow arise out of matter and its interactions. To this matter hypothesis of science, Vedanta says no, not only does God exist but the soul also exists. What's more, matter is not the final reality. Because even beyond the realms of atoms and subatomic particles, in fact transcending both space and time lies the ultimate reality, an infinite ocean of consciousness which is the real source of matter. So matter arises from consciousness. And so we arrive at the key points of distinction between science and Vedanta. While science says that the whole world can be reduced to matter and its interactions, in other words matter is primary and consciousness is secondary, Vedanta says just the opposite. It says that the whole world reduces not to matter but to consciousness and consciousness is primary and matter is secondary. In other words, human beings are not robotic machines like science tells us but spiritual beings. In fact, the whole universe is alive because it is a manifestation of God himself. This brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to read part 4 of our consciousness conundrum series, a link to which is provided below. Goodbye and I shall see you in the next video. Meanwhile, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe.